Hello, welcome back to another Vinyl Show and Tell. So, back again, nice and quick for a change. Two videos in the space of a week. You lucky, lucky people, what's going on? Um, nothing really specific to talk about today, apart from records, of course, otherwise, you know, there'd be no channel, would there? <laughs> but um, I just wanted to keep in the game after sort of not doing too many videos of late, so I just thought I'd show what I've been listening to last night and over the last week and a couple of purchases. Um, to throw in as well. So yeah, that's all you're going to get today. Let's dig in. Let's not rabbit on. Let's get on with this. Right. First off, this is what this. These are the few I've been listening to over the last few days. So uh, um, debut spin on this one. Uh, this is Peter Hamill with Sitting Targets, 1981. Um, I'm pretty fond of Peter Hamill stuff. I've got a lot of his albums. This is the actual latest one I've got. When I say latest, the latest in terms of chronological release. But at, at the same time, it is the last one I bought. So it's really, really good. I've only played it once. I was really hooked. Um, it's got a much more fuller sound than the previous albums that he did. Um, in like 1980, in the late 70s, he was he's very much a what you would call a, what, a proper solo artist. He... Uh, it, everything sounded very minimalistic. There wasn't a, an awful lot of instrumentation going on. It was very, very stark sounding. But here he's got a full band. Um, it's a very, very new wavy sound. And um, it really high fidelity. Very, very high fidelity. I was amazed, sort of, you know, it was, it, it was one of those ones that's just bouncing out the speakers. You know, it sounds great. Beautiful copy on original on Virgin. Really, really good. Looking forward to spinning it again. So yeah, Peter Hamill, Sitting Targets. If you fancy hearing it, check it out, please. Okay, another one. There's a band called Bob. Now I've mentioned Bob a couple of times on this channel, I know I have. I know I've shown off their um, proper, their only proper album, which is called Leave the Straight Life Behind. This one's called Swag Stack. And it's actually a compilation of all their early singles from sort of 1986 to 87. Um, only played once, again, not bad. I think it will certainly grow on me. I'll certainly check it out again. It's, it's a very sort of typical of the time, jangle pop, kind of quirky. Um, I, it, on first listen, I don't think to my ears it sounds as good as their album, which they released in 1990, which to me sounded a bit heavier, a bit tighter, a bit more focused. But this is all right. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. I've got I've got another I've got an EP sitting upstairs as well which I haven't played yet. So uh yeah. Good. Very very good. I think I've got a feeling Bob might have been part of the C86 compilation. Is it the enemy that did that or was it Melody Maker? They may well have been. I should look these things up as usual. I haven't done my homework, have I? Not with George. <laughs> but um, if they weren't on C86, they should have been. It really is in that sort of vein. So, uh, good stuff. Okay, from last night's listening session. Right, first off, we've got some prog. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be this channel without prog, would it? Debut album, self-titled Gr by Greenslade. So, um, this, uh, they could be classed as a sort of mini prog super group, to be honest with you. All four members have been in previous bands. You've got the drummer from King Crimson on the Lizard album, and then he joined Feel, the excellent Feels. Dave Lawson on keyboards from the web. And from Coliseum, you've got Dave Greenslade, hence the band title, who's probably the band leader. And uh, the bass player, whose name I have forgotten. Tony Reeves from Coliseum on the bass. So you've actually got two keyboard players here, no guitarist. Um, it's, I mean, if you like your prog, this is really essential. It's symphonic, very symphonic, excellent musicianship, great production, really, really good. If prog's not your scene, uh, avoid, avoid like the plague. I mean, it is, a, it is a proggy as it gets, it really is. It's kind of... You know, it would appeal to anyone who likes uh, early Yes, early ELP, uh, that kind of thing. It is full of keyboards, Hammond, Mellotrons, electric piano, you name it. It's all in there. It's really good. I, I really like it. A wonderful Roger Dean sleeve there. It's unmistakable, isn't it? The, the sleeves that he does. Absolutely brilliant. 
and this is a first, first, scarce first pressing on the Green Warner Brothers. Later pressings they had the palm tree Burbank style. So I've got a nice first press on that. So yeah, lovely stuff. Not not terribly rare or pricey this one. If you like, if you like your prog, well worth checking out. Well worth it. Right, so next up we've got yet another band I've been talking about quite a bit here on my channel. Fingerprints. This album is called Distinguishing Marks. Uh, it's their second record. Now I've talked about Fingerprints because I did a uh, video on obscure post-punk albums that I really like. And I this is their second album which I've had for years. I picked up their first and third albums um, very, very cheap in the last year. Now when I got this, which was several years ago, I didn't go much on it. I, I, I was, I don't know, I sort of played it a few times then put it away. However, I saw their first and third albums recently. They were so cheap, I thought I'll give them a listen. And I, I loved them, I, I love them. Loved them. I didn't, didn't love them in the past tense, I absolutely love them and playing them a lot. So it made me think, well, let's dig this second one out, see, see if I was wrong. To be honest with you, <laughs> all three albums are very different from each other and this one I think they've tried to go down a much more commercial route it's very sort of, it's a power pop record which is fine but just the compositions are just not that good I think a lot of bands in the late 70s I could name so many they suffered from what you probably called second album syndrome where all the all the good material was used up on their first that they rehearsed for years and then the second one was rushed out um it was okay. I, I probably will give it another spin soon, actually. They, they, it did have its moments, but it just didn't... It, it's not a patch on the first album, which is kind of post-punky and edgy, and the third one, which is really kind of new wavy and funky. This one just is a bit straight-ahead power pop, but it's, it's all right. Um, original on Virgin, um, very cheap. I don't think the camera will bring this up. I'm going to bring it forward, but if you look, all of these pictures here which correspond to all of the 12 tracks. Around the edges here, they are perforated. So if you very carefully wanted to, you could remove these and have these as kind of like some postcards. I'm not gonna do that because the nerd in me, I want my sleeve to be VG plus or better, thank you very much. Um, Virgin Records, I like it when Virgin Records, they kind of do variants, sometimes do variants on their typical design. And this is a nice stark black and white. So again, being a sucker for a label design, I really like that. I checked this on Discogs yesterday and um, all three Fingerprints albums were released at the time, early 80s, whenever it was. Various territories, I had a cassette release. No release after that, that was it. No reissue, not even a CD release. Weird. So this is the thing, if you want fingerprints albums, very, very cheap, they do turn up in the wild, they are on Discogs, but it's original pressing, or not at all, yeah. There's no MoFi on those, I can tell you. Very strange, very strange. We'll retouch on this again in a minute. Right, what we got next up, this is, oh God, this album is about to, I played it, and it's one of the one. it's one where I was like, oh, I can't believe how good this is. It's a scarce one. This is a band called Jean Duc de Grey. The album is called Mice and Rats in the Loft. It's their second album. It's released on Transatlantic. Beautiful, beautiful Transatlantic label there. This is so hard to explain this one. It's from 1971. Just three tracks. First track takes up the whole of side one. Two lengthy ones on side two. Is it folk? Quite possibly. It is kind of like a heavy, twisted, psychedelic folk. I can't really, I, I, I was listening to it and I'm like, does this sound like anyone else? No, it doesn't. It is, it only sounds like them. And it is absolutely fabulous. The first track, it just takes all these twists and turns but it's got this lush orchestration in the background considering the band sounds kind of minimalist they've actually got no bass of any kind there's no bass guitarist it's kind of tr uh, trumpet woodwinds a drummer and a guitarist and vocalist it's a it's a strange setup 
Um, if you if you like your early 70s psychedelia and prog and folk, you, you have to get this. Now, I bought this many years ago. This was affordable. It has gone up in price, the originals on Transatlantic. I've had a look and there are reissues of this on CD and vinyl and they're out there. They're not expensive. It's so if you, if you do want to hear it and you don't want to fork out for an original um, or kind of old original, whatever, then this is the way to go. There they are on the back cover. I just love these. <laughs> I love these bands from the early 70s. Look at them. I mean, that, that, that is a fantastic shot. Absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, read a little fact about this band recently. I don't know. I, I think it's true. It must be true. I'm, I don't see why it wouldn't be. Um, this is one for uh, all you viewers down around the Hampshire area. I know there's a couple of you from Southampton and certainly around that area. Um, this band were the first ever band in 1971 to play the Southampton um, Concert Hall, gig, place, whatever you want to call it, called The Joiners. Now, I'm sure many of you will know The Joiners. M many of you must. I, I imagine there's people in the Southampton area that have been to The Joiners many times. I've only actually done it once myself. But according to this, they were the first ever band to play there. So a little bit of a legendary... Uh, a little bit of a legendary sort of gig venue, a very small gig venue. I think everyone's played there when they were starting out. And uh, they were the first. So, again, recommended to the hilt, this band and the album. It is absolutely, it's mind-blowingly good. It really is. We've got another good one here. Oh, so much to say about this one. Been a little while since I played it, and it is a massive favourite of mine. It is Last Splash by The Breeders. I'm privy to have an original pressing here, and it's got a seven inch, which apparently is worth a bit of money. I mean, when I when I bought this, which would have been about the mid early to mid noughties, I was going for a phase of um, bidding on bidding frenzied on eBay because eBay was a relatively new thing. So I, I I think I paid about fifteen to twenty quid at the time for this, which was very reasonable. Anyway, um. Oh, I was thinking about this and I'm like, do you know what, this could be the best album of the 90s that I know of. It's wonderful. This is, it's the Breeders second album, the first album's called Pod and I know a lot of people, oh, I do like Pod, a lot of people rate that as their best but to me it, it's this one. I can't compare it to albums they release later on, they're one of these bands that seem to take sort of eight years gaps between all their records. I don't know what the later ones sound like. Um, when this first came out, um, a lot of my friends who were into kind of the indie Brit pop scene, it's not, they're not a British band, but that kind of scene, um, they, all got, they all got this and it was played a lot and um, at the time I was so on the fence with the, the, the bands of the time, really were, um, I, I was busy listening to Hot Rats in the Court of the Crimson King. Um, but I remember I actually really liked this record right from the start when everyone had it on CD. Um, I did get someone to even put, uh, put it on cassette for me so I could listen to it <laughs> without trying to locate this at the time, which probably would have been quite difficult pre-internet, I'd imagine. I don't, what can I say about it? It's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's on 4AD and it seems to fit the label sound of the time. It's kind of like dream poppy, grunt, heavy grungy. There's Americana going, uh, going on in there post-punk psychedelia it's it's a real melting pot of sounds and the thing that the sort of things that they do on the guitars it's it's very kind of shoegazy you know they, they clearly there's a lot of I was listening to it there's a lot of effects going on the sort of things you might hear from my bloody valentine where they've got effects pedals everywhere but then they do these other tracks where i'm like oh that sounds like they're playing rickenbackers you know it sounds like a real jangle uh, you know kind of like a jangle poppy sound it's it's a wonderful 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 record it's a five star record not a duff track on it if it has been reissued if you don't know it haven't got it then just try and get hold of it uh the big single off this cannonball is a magnificent track i and uh, you know i remember that being out at the time um Maybe a little bit overplayed. You could almost say it's um, 
an overplay track that I love. See what I just did there, but I don't think it's that overplayed. I never hear it on commercial radio. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, check my last video out and the accompanying rant that went with that. But um, yeah, what, what more can I say about it? It's, um, I stand by my opinion, one of the best albums of the 90s, Breeders' Last Splash. Get it, get it, get it. Just pick it up or just have a listen online. You won't regret it, trust me. Okay, the last one that I played last night. I suspect everyone's got this. So yeah, much. I've got a lot to say on this one. So uh, <laughs> the Stooges Funhouse, you know what it is. You know what it is. So uh, I've got both Stooges albums and they've sat unplayed in my collection for years because when I first got them, I never really went much on them. Uh, recently I made a... I made um, some shorts because I wasn't doing videos proper, but I wanted to keep in the loop, so I did some shorts. And the first short that I did um, was a quick one minute review of their debut album, which I dug out recently after not liking it, buying it years ago, and now really liking it and kind of regretting it. But tastes expand, tastes change, that's the way it is. So on the back of that, I thought, oh, I'll dig Funhouse out, put it on. Brilliant. Brilliant. I always thought Funhouse was all right, but I, I thought nothing more of that. Uh, it was recommended to me by um, a, a, a friend of mine, I'm, I'm C. Brages, and he, he urged me to get it. And I got it and I was like, yeah, that's not bad. But do you know what? It is absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Um, one, thing, one thing I will say about it, I mean, this, it, it's, it's supposedly a seminal album and I get it I, I get what it is I mean people you know it is regarded now as a classic I was kind of looking this up on again on discogs at the sort of issues you know the Amer original American issues and the original UK issues over the years and it's it seems to be to, regarded as a real punk influence all the punk bands at the time yeah listen to the Stooges yeah do you know what this an original UK, which this isn't by the way, an original UK pressing, there can't, there can't have been more than about a hundred of them circulating around the UK. It's so rare and expensive. I, my, my point is here is, were the Stooges that much of an influence on punk? How much were they on punk? It's a little bit similar to everyone sort of in the 70s saying, oh yeah, I got into the Velvet Underground right from the start in the UK and I'm like in the UK the Valve Underground were um they were unheard of. No no one knew who they were. And to me it seemed it probably is the same way of the Stooges really. They they I don't think people were listening to them all the way through the 70s in the UK. They were they were listening to Deep Purple. They were listening to Atomic Rooster. They were listening to Fairport Convention. But people didn't want to admit that when you were punk. They hid all those albums away. I think it's only really, certainly in the UK, in hindsight, that this record became so seminal. Um, that could be very, very different in North America, Canada, and the US. I think certainly this was much, much more successful and probably much more influ um, um, influential. But co please correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you, if you were, if you were of an older age than me and you were around in the UK in the 70s, listening to music. Was this getting played? Did people have this? Because the other thing I would say about it is it's, I, I suppose it is a bit punky, but to me it's just a seminal, great, heavy psych, hard rock record. I mean, they're not virtuosos on their, in, on their instruments. I think that's probably what the punk appeal is, is the fact that it is quite simplistic. But to be, to be fair, I mean, Ron Ashton, he's a bit of a demon on the guitar. There are guitar solos on this. I'm like, that's not very punk at all, is it? People don't, you know, punks, they don't like that sort of thing. <laughs> anyway, it's, um, yeah, my little two pennies. It just, I, I think about this sort of stuff, especially these days, you know, when as time goes on and things get more influential and bands get more popular now than they ever were at the time. And I think this is probably no exception. Um, in case you're wondering what issue this is, this is a nice, uh, this Canadian pressing, early 70s, uh, no, no, correct me, not correct me, correct myself, late 70s Canadian, sounds absolutely fantastic, I think it's pressed about 78 or 79, um, original UK or US, forget it, unless I see one in a charity shop, which isn't going to happen, they cost hundreds of pounds, this does absolutely the job fine, sounds brilliant.
and it's um didn't cost me very much at the time so there we go right and just to finish off four albums that i've bought recently i haven't played any of these yet but i'll show them off anyway i've got one or two things to say on them so first off nice up-to-date bands we've got a band called temples i went to see this band um, about two or three weeks ago in brighton uh, a little venue called patterns i've never never heard of it until now um, I was a mate of mine who's listened to them for years and has been convincing me for years to go and see them. Um, I finally relented and went because, the, you know, to be fair, the tickets were very reasonable for a change. Um, oh, I really love them. Absolutely great. They're a neo, what I think, pigeonhole them into a sort of neo-psychedelic band. Um, got jangly guitars, a little bit of post-punk going in there, a little bit of glam. There's certainly a lot of influences, but you know, they, they, they had a very, very original sound. Their gig sounded fantastic. You know, sometimes it can be ear bleeding, distorted. It was nice and loud, but it was just, the sound balance was brilliant. It was a really good venue. It wasn't, it wasn't sort of too echoey in there. Um, very, very good, really good performers. And I have played a few of these tracks on YouTube before and yeah it's a great kind of distorted vocals neo psychedelia kind of a sound so uh, they're really really they're a really good band they've done four albums this is their third um, great deal there we are I don't know if you know where you can see that but we've got a lovely deep red wax there I do like a bit of coloured vinyl really I'm a bit of a sucker for it um, and a lovely package, good bargain as well. I got this from Rough Trade on eBay. They'd already reduced it, and then I got a ten percent voucher off from eBay. So fifteen pounds with P and P, not bad for a back brand new record. Very good. Uh, next up, I can't say too much about this other than it is a American prog band. I haven't played it yet. I I led got led to it from a Facebook group I belong to. It's called Mr Flood's Party. It's a one and done on the Cotillion label, I think that's how you pronounce Cotillion, the uh, subsidiary of Atlantic. Um, yes, Heavy Psych, Prog Rock from the United States, never released in the UK, and there's a seller on Discogs who had one, so I'm like, right, do you know what, I'm gonna snap that up, it's a very reasonable price, looks interesting. One day I will report back on the channel once I've played it, what it sounds like. I mean, you can check it out yourself, but Mr. Fuzz Party, there we go. E quite easy to obtain in the United States, that one. It, it's, not, it's not a rare one, but not easy to get here in the UK or, or indeed anywhere in Europe. Um, and another one and done prog band from the United States. This is actually a UK press, so it's called Tarantula. Brilliant cover, that is. Absolutely fantastic. Um, by all accounts, this is kind of a, a Zappa-like, jazzy, psychedelic prog band. Look forward to playing it, but um, again, I can't tell you too much about the music. But I will do, and it's out there if you want. Finally, I haven't played this yet, but I do know the band. Um, this band is called The Box Post Punk Band. I've been after this for ages, and... Oh, great. The seller who had Tarantula and Mr. Flaz Party. I, was, I had a watch on them and Discogs, and all of a sudden he had this for £4. I was like, oh, I'll get it in the basket as well. Wonderful. I was so pleased. Uh, the album is called Secrets Out. They're a great band. I've got, I've got a mini album by them. Um, and oh, the name of it's just escaped me. I know what it's called, but I'm in front of the camera, so the name has escaped me. Great Moments in Big Slam, that's what it's called. I knew it would come to me. It would have to be a caption on the final edit if I didn't know. Um, and that is a fantastic album. It's only about sort of eight tracks long and it's a real kind of heavy saxophone based avant-garde post-punk. It's really, really jagged and strange. Um, I, I think this is of the same vein. Some weird song titles. The opening track is called Water Grows Teeth. I mean, what, what a song title that is. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to playing this. Been after it for a while. I actually think I should, from memory, I think I actually showed the box and that album, other album I just talked about, I think I showed that. My first ever video, I'm sure I did. Could be wrong. But anyway, a good one. Never see it in the wild. 
Like fingerprints, I checked this out on Discogs and it was released in the UK, the Netherlands and Italy in 1983 and then it was gone. Out of print, never to be repeated, no CD, no recent reissue, nothing. Strange. How does this happen? I mean, I, I, can, only, I can only imagine that master tapes go missing and it does make it difficult, but with the amount of things that do get reissued, over the years. I'm sure there's many reissues that are good quality vinyl rips. I really do. And it just makes me wonder what causes an album to just never be reissued again. You know, there's, I've mentioned it before in my post-punk video, there's just no interest of this stuff. None at all. When it comes to classic rock, I mean, this is an obscure record. That's obscure. Tarantula, you know, be, be, you know, I'm, I'm, Without patronising, I'm sure a lot of you haven't heard of this. I haven't heard of it until quite recently. But the price I paid means it's collectible because it costs a, a fair amount more than the box. So, and I think it is on CD, which means there is a demand for it. But no demand for this at all. Four pounds, no collectible value, no reissue. Why? They're brilliant. Weird. What can I say? That's just the way it is. I've made, I should be glad it's cheap. Irish records were all £4. Imagine how amazing that would be. All records, £5 and under. God, I wouldn't be able to move for them. <laughs> right, anyway, that's it. That's all, folks, as they say. So uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, video should be coming much more regular soon. Um, I am coming up to a season of being more out and about, buying records and hopefully might be able to do a few more uh, location shots over the next coming months leading up to Christmas. Christmas is upon us, it's not far. Before you know it, bang, the decorations will be up and then it'll all be over. But uh, yeah, please stay tuned, give me a like, give me a subscribe, please comment. I love to hear your comments, always, always good to hear from you. And uh, yeah, until the next time, uh, happy spinning, take care, enjoy yourselves, get some records and uh, I'll see you again. Bye-bye.